we have to talk about consciousness. Our life is actually a midpoint between the two deaths. To use the sexual energy in order to achieve enlightenment. The three-dimensional spiral shape encoded in our DNA, in our biology. Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode from the Discomfort Zone podcast. Uh, I'm Olev as always here, very happy to be with you this evening. Oh, and I can see we've got Revised Sociology here, Rondon, great to see you as well. And Avelina, I believe, I don't remember seeing you here before. Is this your first time? If so, welcome. And if not, welcome nonetheless. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um... Yeah, I hope you're all doing okay and ready for another another brand new episode. And in fact, since uh, last week, we we didn't get all the way to the end of what I had planned. I thought we'd carry on with a little bit of that. And uh, we'll see where we get. We might just uh, finish up with the subject this week. And if we have time in the end, we might carry on a little bit with our narrative, which I feel we've, uh, we've had a while. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an interesting one to, uh, to jump in through. But uh, how are you on aliens, UFOs, etc.? Um, yeah, alien honey. Uh, yeah, let me know in the chat. Uh, today's subject is continuation of uh, our discussion of aliens. Uh, what is the phenomena and what we're talking about and the different uh, species, which in fact is the first subject that we are going to uh, touch on now. So I thought it would be... Uh, oh, good, I'm glad to hear. It would be a good idea. Oh, sorry. How are my levels? It sounded a bit clipped. Let me know if it's uh, okay with you. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to set that up. Okay. So, I thought it would be a good place to start with the few species that we have already mentioned in this podcast. And uh, there have definitely been quite a few. Some we've mentioned more uh, in depth and thoroughly than others. But uh, we'll go over them very, not very um, deeply. Because, as I said last time, uh, this is not my area of expertise in any way. I am uh, really more interested in always seeing the patterns, the big picture, how these things fit in. I'm not very good on details and things like ufology and the different types of aircrafts and the different species and what they each uh, are or represent uh, is a subject that I'm not that familiar with. However, having said that, since we are talking a lot about it, then I thought we should uh, at least cover the, the range that we've spoken and mentioned already to sort of have a nice baseline to start from. Oh, great to see you here, Alien Honey. Glad you could make it. Oh, and LF, LPF, sorry, LP Faust. I always get that wrong. Pleasure to have you as well. <laughs> um, oh, nice. I'm glad, I'm glad. Okay. So, obviously, the first species that we have uh, ever talked about and we've gone into many, many uh, episodes are the Anunnaki, uh, as they are mentioned or called by the uh, Sumerians, and with, uh, in Sitchin's words, really, the Niburians, since they come from the planet Nibiru. So, these are the first example that we're going to uh, mention, but since we've really spoken about them quite a lot, I think uh, we don't have to spend too much time. These are beings that apparently are very similar uh, in their physical appearances to uh, humans, and indeed we uh, share their, their uh, half of our DNA with them. Uh, the sentence to making man in the image of God seems to be uh, sort of based on that part of the story. And really and truly, um, there isn't much mention in Sitchin's writings as to their spirituality, shall we say. Uh, as we've mentioned many, many times, Sitchin is very focused on the physical, the practical, the empirical, uh, the scientific approach, and focuses much, much more on their technological abilities and their scientific understandings, and really very, very lightly touches on anything that's sort of spiritual, metaphysical, etc. Having said that, oh, hi, Frankie Wan, great to see you. Yay! I'm glad you're here on time as well. Good one uh, this week. And Darisco. Oh, wow. Lots and lots of people. I apologize if I don't uh, see you as you come. And Swoop. Great to have you as well. Oh, wow. What an audience. Wonderful. So, 
there, there is um, Drumvalo, as he's also mentioned, Sitchin's timeline talks about the Anunnaki from Nibiru. And when he mentions it, he speaks of them also as the um, originators of the human species, as being um, a, a, a being of a higher level, a higher dimension uh, than humans. And that although their technology was superior to ours, um, in fact, their spiritual development was also uh, superior. And when uh, we're, we're going to get to this, the spiritual side of the Anunnaki in much, much greater deal uh, when we reach Gerald Clark series. And so Gerald Clark has done a lot of work. And indeed, a lot of his descriptions uh, when he talks about the spiritual work is really uh, Enki's doing in his attempt to raise uh, the human beings to be of a higher spiritual level. And so we're going to talk about all of that in the later series. But for now, we're going to move on because there are a few other species that we haven't spoken about much uh, before. And I thought I would just mention the two from the story now because those are the most recent, which are the Martians, obviously, whom we've spoken about a bit, and the Hebrews that were only mentioned in sort of a very brief sentence uh, by Drumvalo until now. But nonetheless, it's an interesting uh, crossover as we can relate with the mention of Hebrews to Sitchin's talk of the Hebrew people being a very important part of the tale. Now, according to Sitchin, uh, the Hebrew people obviously are not aliens, they're human beings in a culture that has developed. But as we trace the history, or has Sitchin traced it himself, we see that the Hebrews seem to share a very ancient history with um, the Anunnaki, with Nibiru, and that in fact the religion, uh, according to Sitchin, um, Abraham was actually a, a priest, a high priest from the Niburian uh, faith who was not just um, a religious figure, but actually the communicator between the Anunnaki and the people and really charged with um, being the mediator. And so this kind of relationship, this kind of close contact seems to also imply, as, uh, as Drunvalo mentions, that the Hebrews might have an extraterrestrial origin. Uh, having said that, in Druvalo's words, the Hebrews were not just the people who came afterwards, but actually a separate race. And this race um, was, is more advanced than the uh, counterpart humans of that time. And as they joined um, the human evolution timeline, they joined in an attempt to sort of finish uh, their last uh, step in their evolutionary process before they could advance to become uh, higher beings of a higher dimension which seems to suggest that the hebrews were of the same uh, dimension the same frequency as the beings on uh, lemuria uh, sorry not lemuria uh, atlantis but that nonetheless um, they were more advanced and closer to finishing that cycle and actually uh, changing uh, uh, frequencies to a higher dimension so uh, it's, it's an interesting thought. I, I hope I, I will just mention this in case anyone thinks for a moment. Um, I in no way think that this is related to the Jewish people of today. And in fact, I mentioned before the difference between Hebrew and Jewish and what we have today, uh, you know, the religion, the faith that I originally come from is very, very far removed from a lot of these things. So I don't want to, I want to make it absolutely clear. <laughs> um, in Drunvalo's timeline, this uh, race of aliens was a race that was here in its physical existence, though it was more advanced and it was able to sort of find the, uh, the free vortex, the empty vortex on Atlantis and, you know, teleport, uh, join this timeline, but nonetheless join it in their physical appearance, in their physical being. So that was a little bit about the Hebrews. The Martians, on the other hand, um, we know a little bit more about. And indeed, the term Martian is a very uh, old term in terms of UFO history. Uh, one of the earlier planets that people started uh, considering that there might be uh, alien life form on it. And for those of you who are interested, I'll uh, very shortly mention that uh, Nikolai Tesla, who was the famous uh, electrical engineer, worked on a certain um, machine that he claimed could pick up sort of radio signals from from out of space. And although uh, I, I've read quite a bit about it, and there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of researchers who debunk it completely and who say that the whole 
uh, um, idea of it was that it was um, what he thought he was picking up from out of, uh, out of uh, Earth was actually originating from Earth. Um, oh, no, no problem. I, uh, I hope you have a good meeting. And if you want to uh, listen to the episode later, don't forget you can now listen to them on the podcast apps. Uh, just look for DZP uh, Podcast. Um, but great to see you for uh, the short while that we did. So having said that, I personally uh, have read a lot of different books about Tesla, and it seems that the likelihood that he had some contact with some uh, shall we say, alien being, is in my mind very, very likely. Although he seems to have had more sort of metaphysical uh, experiences and his technologies were, were more bound to earth and ground here. But nonetheless, um, when he talks about picking up these alien signals, he mentions the planet Mars uh, specifically, and uh, he speaks of the Martians as a race that is attempting to contact Earth. And this was a very um, sort of common theme and was talked about a lot in the early uh, 50s. But what Druvalo is talking about here is not um, the flying saucers or the different sort of radio waves that we're talking about, but rather um, long, long before then, when the Marshall race was actually um, sort of leaving Mars after the catastrophe that had wiped out life on that planet. And that's why they joined this evolutionary timeline, just as a way, a means of survival. Now, if that is the case, that uh, would mean that Mars itself was not inhabited by any uh, beings, um, which seems to certainly fall in line with our understanding of Mars today with, uh, you know, modern space uh, technology. But if you are interested, there is a lot of evidence or there are a few pictures that we can see of Mars of very, very strange uh, structures that seem to at least hint or, you know, give uh, signs to the fact that once there may have very well been a an advanced civilization uh, thriving there, and indeed if it was wiped out a million years ago by some cataclysm, uh, it would be very hard for us to pick up on that now. So the martial race in general, as is described as we've gone over, is a very um, logical uh, left hemisphere, you know, masculine race as opposed to a more spiritual. And it seems that this is a, a division we keep coming to time and time again, both, both in Druvalo's book and indeed uh, in general, this idea of technology, you know, versus nature, let's say, or science versus spirituality. And it seems that that's a sort of scale with two extremes, and you can uh, sort of fluctuate on that scale as a, as a race, as a species. We can see that the human race in general throughout history um, leaned much more heavily towards, let's say, the natural or the spiritual uh, side of things, whether we call them religious systems, etc. And as we advanced um, in our understanding, we moved forward towards uh, the scientific approach, which today seems to really... Um, dominate most cultures at least in the west um interesting to think that there are some cultures and i wouldn't say that that's you know in any way a better or worse culture but the chinese for example have a lot of what we in the west call superstition um what you could call spirituality but definitely you know it doesn't fall into the same category as science um and they have a lot of that uh, balancing out even their most you know logical decisions like in business or in scientific research um there was an interesting experiment that they were doing which was seeing the effect of i think it was just prayer on um or meditation on a, a cancer tumor and actually having a live sort of video in the hospital where they uh, are filming the 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 progress and the uh, the process of the experiment and indeed, in the hospital, they have, uh, you know, people who practitioners who in the West are considered non-scientific. But it seems that they have more of a balance than, for example, where we would take science completely in most professions and completely ignore the, uh, the spiritual side. And the Martians seem to fit this category uh, much more technologically inclined and really focusing on that way of viewing the world. So we've spoken about them quite a bit. The two other races that I want to mention are probably um, 
in terms of new age and, and that whole scene, uh, the more familiar ones, the more famous ones today, I would say. Um, and they are the Syrians, whom we've mentioned very briefly, and the Palladians, whom we haven't spoken about at all. Now, you'll notice, or maybe you won't, but uh, like the Martians, these two races are actually named after um, the planet that they are supposed to have originated from. Um, and this is obviously a, a very logical categorization. Uh, if we'll talk a little bit about them in terms of how Drunvalo uh, describes, uh, the Syrians and the Palladians are actually, in his words, sort of uh, beneficial, uh, guiding, uh, um, what's the term, like uh, uh, positive forces uh, in the world, um, sort of races of uh, service, both to mankind and indeed in, in the galaxy. Oh, Hive QA, wonderful to have you again. I keep forgetting the other name, but yes, great to have you. Um, and indeed, uh, I, I should mention that the Syrians, some people do claim that they are uh, not positive, that they are sort of more destructive and in their, in their contact with human beings, they're actually sort of manipulating or trying to, you know, seize control in one way or another. But a Definitely, according to Druvalo, if I'll uh, remind you all, that in the story of creation, um, it was not only the Anunnaki, the Niburians, who were the um, feminine side of our creation, but the Syrians uh, joined in as the masculine side. And in his description, the Syrians are actually not the same dimension or vibration um, as the Anunnaki, as the humans, they are of a higher vibratory level. They weren't actually there um, in a physical body. They were there in a uh, ethereal body, as it were. Um, these are also terms that we've gone over. I hope it's not too confusing. The term ethereal, maybe I'll just very quickly clear it up, because when we speak of ethereal, we can speak of one of the human quote-unquote bodies. Um, there's the physical body, obviously, and then there's the ethereal body, the mental body. Um, these are sort of different parts of the human consciousness, the human psyche. Um, but the word ethereal literally means from the ether or ether-like, and it can be used to describe a state of being, um, of another being, let's say, that is non-physical. And in that case, it's not sort of uh, part of the physical being. It's not, as is with the humans, uh, you know, one body out of many, but it can be this, the the uh, continuous state of that being is ethereal, meaning they don't actually have a physical body because they are not existing in the physical realm, in the physical uh, spectrum of the uh, the vibration. Uh, the ether is what binds us. It's, uh, I read a very interesting book um, from electromagnetic, uh, sorry, uh, electrical engineering called um, theories of the ether until the 19th century because, well, in the 19th century for the, okay, this is a little off topic. So maybe we'll, uh, <laughs> I'll just finish the story because it, it, it does tie in interestingly to the ether, but then we'll, uh, we'll get back to it. Um, I hope this isn't too boring for those of you. I'm very, very interested in, uh, electromagnetism as the usual listeners will know. Um, but the theory of the ether was actually a completely accepted physical uh, theory uh, for, for, for generations throughout, um, and it was used exactly as to describe as the sort of um, the substance of, of reality, you know, that thing where all particles can interact. Um, but the, the, the problem happened in really the early 19th century when there was a, uh, an experiment to try and measure how uh, sort of dense the ether is by measuring the speed of light through it and see <laughs> there's always one uh, no no and measuring uh, how long it will take a ray of light to travel through uh, the ether and sort of devising this plan where you would measure it with um the spiral the direction of the earth and against it and the difference would give you the actual difference in the uh, resistance of the uh, ether i might not be a hundred percent right on that details but look it up if you're interested point is they conducted the experiment and they discovered that there was no change in the speed of light and so because the speed of light was deemed a constant um, the the answer the um, sort of the realization, the conclusion that they reached was that there is no such thing as the ether. 
And then from that one experiment, um, the ether was uh, considered just complete fallacy and was never mentioned scientifically again. And it's very interesting because although I won't mention uh, the speed of light, the problems with it and everything that we've learned since then, although it's a fascinating topic, subject uh, in and of itself, um, the ether as a theory, regardless of the speed of light, is a very, very um, logical one, an easy one for us to sort of imagine, I think. It, it fits a lot of our current models. So I'm, I'm convinced that at some point science will definitely return to the uh, theory of the ether. Um, but until then, it's left to us uh, spiritualists and uh, metaphysicians to uh, to use it as we see please. Now, but um, when I say ethereal bodies uh, regarding the Syrians, if we go back to it, the Syrians weren't simply traveling from a distant planet, uh, leaving their physical body there, but they were ethereal beings. That was the frequency that they were vibrating at, a, uh, a higher frequency. Okay. So I think, oh my gosh, wow, yeah, I think that's uh, covered that. In terms of the Palladians, um, I'll mention very, very briefly, because I really don't want to spend too much time just on the uh, species, but the Palladians are considered a sort of very much a group uh, consciousness. So although you can sort of, there are mentions of individuals, uh, in general, it's considered a unified uh, race. And obviously they come from the uh, Palladian planets that are, near our solar system and they are i think i've never heard i think of accepted by all as being positive influences people who are in contact with them mention them as uh shall we use the word angelic uh, indeed and sort of beings that are watching over earth to make sure that everything is okay oh and just there was a video i apologize i see that there's a little bit of a problem with my green screen there so i'll just fix that okay those who are listening, that was riveting, I'm sure. But, <laughs> so those are a few of the races. The last race, which I, um, the last two races, which I didn't mention, um, were the Greys and the Reptilians. And if you've heard of either of those, um, there's a lot of sort of confusion, I think, and a lot of disagreement in general um, about their role and about uh, what they are, you know, uh, functioning as. Um, when it comes to Drunvalo's timeline, which we're discussing, they are both considered sort of negative uh, races who are, when I say negative, I meant um, they are attempting to seize control and sort of use force in order to uh, affect uh, what's happening here on Earth. Um, yeah, oh, sorry, I'm missing a few things. So... Uh, I'll just say that usually, or to my understanding from what it seems, the greys are most associated with uh, the UFOs. And there often seems to be some confusion um, between reptilians and the Anunnaki, uh, thinking that they are actually uh, the same. Um, I've heard more that the reptilians were considered to have come actually from, uh, what is it? Severus, I believe the name is. Um but I'm really getting out of my depth here, so uh, we'll uh, we'll we'll leave it there for now. Oh, Mariano, great of you to join us as well. Welcome as always. Oh, and oh, Z, oh, I hate your name, Z Dika Redirect. Welcome, welcome. I'm uh, I'm so glad you're listening to the live show. Um, okay, I can see that I've missed a few things on chat. Uh, Israel is about to introduce the Ashtar command to the world. We'll see. We'll we'll see about what uh, what will happen. Uh, oh, thanks, Rondon. Yes, I will. I will be in touch. Uh, Sirius. Sirius? The Syrians are from, uh, from Sirius. Ah, uh, from... Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, there's... Yes, we, we won't go into uh, any more details right now because there's a lot of, a lot of disagreement, honestly, and I really... Uh, I don't think I know uh, the absolute truth about these subjects. So, as I said, that's just a little bit to sort of clear... Maybe remind us, some of us, for those of you who are, this is uh, your first episode. I hope it's not too much um, for all in one take. But we'll move on to something a little bit more uh, familiar, I think, now, which is this very interesting crossover, which which uh, we talked about many, many times, and I mentioned uh, in the last episode, between spirituality and aliens, between sort of the concept of gods, uh, the plural, um, and extraterrestrials. And... The reason I feel the need to come back to it is because 
we I actually went back to listen because uh, I wasn't sure what I'd mentioned in the last episode. And I did actually very briefly mention the next bit of the narrative, which is where Drunvalo uh, talks about um, this body, this group of uh, higher beings, in his words, who are actually uh, sort of so far above what we are. They're above uh, the Nicoles, they're above sort of ascended humans, um, and they are really uh, the beings whom the Nicoles uh, tried to contact and to ask for help because they were in over their heads. And the reason I, this is actually, you know, way back why I decided to take this break and to talk about aliens, because this concept of, in Drunvalo's words, the group of aliens are called the Galactic Command, which I can't help it always sounds to me like a sci-fi term. You know, it's exactly what, like the Galactic Command or, you know, the whatever. Uh, all of these terms from all of these films. And so it's, 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 a, it's a term that sort of slightly stuck out to me. And I was struggling with it a bit, but it seems to be a concept that comes up time and time again. And if any of you out there listening are skeptics or if this all seems a little bit too uh, out there or even it's just uh, hard to grasp in the beginning... I'd really recommend, if you get the chance, to read some uh, some books about alien channeling. And this is a <laughs> this is a very, uh, I think, niche subject. Uh, it's definitely become much more popular today. And I'd actually steer away from uh, something that's too modern because there's so much out there. It's very easy, I think, to get lost and get sucked into something. Uh, I personally don't believe that all of uh, the people who claim to be channeling. Uh, are actually doing so. But the idea of channeling what we call aliens, and indeed in uh, olden times were called sort of um, uh, spirits, and for a while there's sort of the talk of spirits uh, from the dead, etc. Um, there's, there's many, many instances of people who claim to have been doing this uh, from back then. I'm not saying that all of those are real by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I... Uh, I had some very interesting uh, experiences reading some of these. And I, you know what? I really should have prepared the books. I'm afraid I can't remember the name because it was it was the name of the, the being that was contacted. So it was something like uh, Orion 8 or so, I can't remember. It's not that. But I'll, may, I'll try and find the link. I hope by the time I uh, upload the episode, I'll be able to uh, attach a link underneath. Um, the name of the book. But if you look up this, there's quite a few of them around. I'd recommend reading a few of them, not even all the way through, because honestly, a lot of them seem to be quite repetitive. A lot of the messages seem to be very much of the same nature. Um, but that's really what you realize, that as you read more and more of them, it seems to be very similar messages uh, time and time again. And I obviously, there's differences in... Uh, you know, messages that are generally not uh, positive. Um, I personally have trouble with, regardless, because I don't think we should be exposing ourselves to sort of negative thoughts uh, by choice when it comes to like things like this. Um, I think if there's, you know, something to be learned from it and the truth, then definitely. But when it comes to channeling aliens that are talking, you know, things like um, the whole idea of thinking that human beings are all, you know, terrible beings that are in danger or going to be, uh, you know, ended or all of these sort of thoughts are very uh, not constructive in my mind. Um, whereas most of the books that I've read have been overwhelmingly positive, saying that humanity is, you know, close to salvation, that it's, uh, you know, they believe in us, they're here to help us, they uh, have done this many times before, there's nothing to be afraid of. That's, I think, a message that even if it isn't true, um, it probably isn't that harmful to us. And it's a good thing to uh, believe that uh, it's possible for us to save ourselves and to be uh, saved. So uh, make sure when you're reading through, uh, my recommendation would be to find uh, positive messages. But there are really so many of them around. And they all agree on a lot of these things. Um, indeed, Edgar Casey, whom we've mentioned, also talks about a lot of these things. And, and, and there's a lot of correlation and one of the subjects that seems to be coming up time and time again is this idea of um, of this higher council, this higher group of beings 
who are charged with really sort of uh, keeping an eye out of <laughs> what's happening on Earth. Um, and in their words, not just Earth, but uh, many other sort of planets and places and things. But nevertheless, that a big part of their uh, spiritual journey is really this uh, maintaining this uh, this situation under control. And so I thought, um, okay, well, yeah, I can see that in chat there was a bit going on, so I'm just going to make sure there's nothing uh, too uh, crucial. Um, no, I'm not talking about Crowley. Crowley, I, I've read a few of his stuff. I just, yeah, I, I like I said, I think that Crowley is a rather negative, uh, you know, a lot of what he talks about, and he really enjoyed uh, the image of being that uh, sort of negative uh, image that he had. Um when it comes to people like Crowley or different uh, people over the years, indeed, uh, John D. I think was another one. Um, these are people who I don't necessarily believe are simply making everything up and lying about everything and, and, and putting on an act. But nevertheless, even if we believe them to be true, um, you can definitely come into contact with beings, as we've mentioned, uh, in the uh, different species who are negative influences, who are out for, you know, control and selfish reasons, etc. And so, as is, uh, this is all, it sounds so fantastical because it fits in to so many of the uh, heroic stories that we know from, at least I know from cinema, but definitely in, you know, books and graphic novels of you know, being good is, is the harder choice of uh, self-sacrifice and giving of yourself, and that's how ultimately you become happier. And if you give in to your selfish uh, wants of control and, uh, you know, getting things for you, then eventually you are, you know, taken over by the demons and the, the price is never worth paying, etc., etc. Uh, literally, you know, it can be argued that almost every story in a way focuses on those uh, categorizations and that uh, understanding. But uh, just because something is a cliché, no matter how cliché it is, doesn't necessarily mean that it's not true. And in fact, very often the opposite uh, is the case. So although these ideas may sound rather sort of very much out there and uh, not out there, just like oversimplified. So it's like, oh, wow, instead of having God, whom the Christians and, you know, uh, monotheism has given to us, who is watching over us and loves us and is doing everything he can, now we can just call it an alien. And we're no different uh, than those people who believe for thousands of years, all those priests. Um, but I do think this is a very a sort of, it can be a different uh, interpretation, a different understanding. And indeed, one of the main things is that in order to sort of, unlike a cult, uh, unlike many religions, um, unlike a lot of these different things, when it comes to a lot of this channeling, um, the ones that I'm talking about, we're not actually required to do anything uh, specific. Um, in fact, the very only very clear, I think, um, instructions that are given uh, in a lot of these books is sort of, um, it's up to the human race to save itself. Uh, we need to achieve hu uh, unity and harmony and to live in peace. Um, we can't carry on destroying the earth, um, you know, and, and, and much less, I think, um, accusatory that I'm, <laughs> than I'm sounding right now, but much more of an understanding of saying this is where humanity is right now. We have uh, the ability and the choice to move forward. Um, and, you know, either way, everything is okay and, uh, you know, n n there's no sort of punishment or reward uh, in that same sense. So I certainly feel much closer to beings, even if they claim to be a higher level, uh, who are very compassionate and very empathetic and uh, understanding as opposed to, uh, you know, judgmental, as the Old Testament seems to me to be very much. Um, so I don't know how we got to that, <laughs> but I was talking about Crowley, whom I wouldn't I mean, uh, obviously, do as you wish, and this is only my opinion, but personally, I haven't read very much because what I read, I just didn't connect to, and I, uh, you know, I like to read things that make me feel good. That's my uh, thing. Um, let's see, Jung is the only one that channeled a being. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember Jung talking specifically about a being. Jung most definitely had a lot of... Um, clairvoyant experiences in his uh, description. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't actually remember if uh, if I remember him talking about a specific being and a specific name, but let me know. 
Okay, I'm trying to look through the chat, but I can see people uh, keep on uh, writing more and more, so I might not get to the end of this. We might carry on. But yes, uh, there's David Icke, absolutely is an expert. I do like listening to him. He has slightly longer uh, lectures, um, but yes. Oh, Cly, I always I always want to call you Kyle. Cly, I remember that time. Wonderful to see you here. Uh, yeah, okay. So we will move on, um, yes, to actually the subject of uh, the Council of, uh, sorry, the Galactic Command. Uh, in this, oh, I can't remember the book, but in the book they're called the Council of Eight. And in fact, the term, the Council of Eight, uh, seems to have been a term that came up uh, in a few books, um, which is why I felt the need to uh, mention it as well, although that it's not uh, Druvelo's term. Uh, doesn't the Galactic Command sound a little bit, you know, uh, childish <laughs> or is that just me let me know um ah your username is designed to create dyslexia that it definitely does so it's it's hard live and on stream to uh yeah <laughs> um okay so what is this idea in general i i can't remember when but i mentioned a book quite a quite a while ago i think during uh sitchin's um called the light of egypt and it's a fascinating book. It's a really a bit of an out there book. It's from the 19th uh, century, Thomas Thomas Burgine, Burgine I believe. Um, and in it, he talks about um, the human evolution from a spiritual perspective. And so this means, uh, as we've mentioned, he talks about uh, reincarnation and reincarnation being the uh, ability of consciousness to evolve, to uh, complexify, to become more sophisticated um, by uh, taking on different physical forms and then leaving those forms uh, while being able to take the experiences that were learned and sort of using that uh, change and that advancement and being reborn in a new physical body and repeating that process over time. And this, just just to mention, I mean, I hope that at this point, um, you know, the idea of reincarnation isn't too far out, <laughs> if you've been listening until now. Uh, but nonetheless, if we consider the, um, I think it's Richard Dawkins' theory, I believe, of sort of genes uh, creating humans as a way to self-replicate and to, you know, advance themselves and to evolve, um, this is sort of the same idea of having an, uh, an idea or something that is uh, sort of non-physical that exceeds uh, the physical body and the limitations of an individual's life. Um, this is the same with memes and cultural evolution, uh, what Alfred Kajibski calls time binding, which is the ability to take the information that we uh, gather in our lives and pass it on to the next generation and have them pass it on. Um, all of these things seem to be processes of evolution that rely on sort of the information and the experience outliving the physical body. And so in that sense, I hope it's a little bit easier to accept um, when we think about evolution as, you know, uh, particles in space and uh, stardust uh, cooling down and, and connecting and et cetera, et cetera, and that eventually evolving into a human body, uh, that seems to be, you know, in my mind, uh, equally miraculous or equally plausible as at the same time having a spiritual um, evolution of consciousness that keeps uh, going into this life form. And indeed, um, we can see a clear difference between a living uh, organism, or at least, I think, in between most. The line gets a bit blurry at times. But if we consider a living organism, which ha has a certain lifespan and is born at a certain time and dies at a certain time, versus, you know, an inanimate uh, object that doesn't necessarily have a same uh, sort of timeline of birth and death, um, we see that that infusion of inanimate, uh, inorganic matter with a life force is that the description of a spiritual consciousness sort of merging with a physical being, uh, with a physical uh, body, in order to have these uh, spiritual experiences that it can take on and evolve further. So if we <laughs> take that very quick uh, analogy of evolution um, and apply it 
we can see that again, um, and I, I believe I've spoken about this before, so I'll be a little more brief, but the anthropocentric perception that humans are the be-all and end-all, that human beings are sort of the highest form that can be evolved, um, seems to be very simplistic and, and a little bit outdated. And if we consider what sort of the next uh, evolution of human beings uh, could be, then it could very well be um, the over-complexification of uh, consciousness to being beyond uh, the physical body. And so if we'd imagine, uh, as we've mentioned um, previously with immortal beings, with, uh, <laughs> yeah, with um, you know, uh, uh, liberated humans who have ascended, uh, apparently, you know, according to them, um, ascended the physical uh, life and death cycle, they've actually uh, sort of evolved spiritually to a higher level of being. And this, for example, is what we uh, talk about or what we think about when it comes to the Nicoles, who are immortals. Um, if we compare that to the Anunnaki, we know that although the Anunnaki's lived a lot longer than uh, human beings, uh, their life cycle was uh, still um, determined in years. It was much, 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 much longer, thousands and thousands and thousands of years, but they still have a point where they were born and a point where they uh, died. Um, and so they were still in this life and death cycle. And so the uh, the Nicoles, sorry, the Nicoles had sort of escaped this life and death cycle where um, their consciousness didn't need to manifest in a new uh, physical body in order to have these uh, experiences and in order to evolve. However, uh, when we consider what it would look like to evolve beyond the Nicoles, um, this is where we start getting into these very very big ideas and. One of the things that is mentioned in the light of Egypt is the idea that um, the solar system itself, so not even, we'll, we'll not get to the, the galaxy yet, but the solar system is in and of itself an evolutionary timeline. And the, uh, the, the solar um, objects, sorry, the celestial, the planets that are in our solar system are not simply gaseous uh, balls of fire or, you know, uh, um, just uh, dead lumps of rock, but they are actually uh, evolved uh, spiritual beings. And that sort of the, the more advanced we see also this um, complexification to some degree uh, requires sort of larger uh, bodies, as it were. Um, and so, yeah, I'm <laughs> I can't possibly read chat. Um, it seems to be like, obviously not in all cases as whales are not more advanced than uh, human beings. But nonetheless, if we think of sort of atoms as being the smallest, they are also the simplest and seem to be the very shortest uh, span of life. And then sort of going up into, you know, uh, uh, molecules and then, you know, organisms, we see that there is a certain correlation between complexification and literal size. And indeed, this is what we also uh, mentioned in Druvula's book, where he said that the different um, levels of consciousness, where we're on sort of the duality level, if you remember, and the next level is that of unity, uh, uni uh, unity consciousness. Um, with each uh, advancement in that level, there is a, uh, a larger size of the body that takes place. Um, this would suit, again, this idea that if we consider very quickly, our planet, uh, planet Earth, I think that's the easiest planet for us to believe or for us to be able to perceive as not just a dead, dead lump of rock, but actually, you know, a being. And if we consider our being, as, um, our body as a sort of uh, planet for all of the different uh, organisms that live in it, the bacteria, the fungi, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we can sort of imagine the Earth being the same as this uh, planet that, uh, in, Alan Watt, in Alan Watt's words, uh, peoples, in the same way, it's actually a very, very advanced being that can uh, create life, not just create one uh, sort of uh, being at a time in a species-oriented way, but actually provide uh, the space for sort of an entire ecosystem, a plethora of species uh, to come into being and to experience. And according to uh, what he says in the book, 
this is uh, one of the more advanced, I wouldn't say it's the final because that's uh, not what's mentioned, but one of the more advanced uh, levels of being frequencies is actually being, uh, you know, quote unquote, a planet or a star which uh, births other planets. Um, so our sun, as we've mentioned, was actually the uh, originator of uh, the solar system. The other planets were sort of born uh, from that sun. And if we look at that evolutionary cycle, which is in and of itself, without any metaphysics, uh, astronomical in scale and understanding, we see that the sun created uh, the earth, which created uh, the organisms, which eventually led to uh, us, to human beings. That's the most scientific uh, evolutionary scale we see that timeline as uh, being a very, very sort of um, connected timeline. Uh, although we don't feel in any way uh, like the sun could have, you know, created us or that it could be, you know, a being because it's just an orange ball in the sky and it's just sort of hot. Um, but nonetheless, realistically, if we look at the time scale of the sun, which is, you know, uh, I'm not sure how many, but billions and billions of years, um, we see that on that grand, grand time scale, the sun was sort of, you know, born and started out and uh, grew and gave birth to a solar system. And over time, that solar system sort of grew. And whether it's just Earth or whether, as we've mentioned, uh, Mars uh, could have also peopled or uh, if Nibiru has come from sun, then actually gave birth to multiple planets, which could give birth to uh, multiple species um, of different organisms. So trying to look at that whole system together, again, we can take this further to say, if we think about galaxies, and if we think about our universe as you know a whole, and then that universe has a part of uh, different frequencies, we can see that we are in this endless scale of both uh, size and complexity and just uh, time periods where atoms are existing sometimes for seconds um, and stars or galaxies exist for uh, you know, billions of billions of years. Um, all that in the middle is like uh, the spectrum and we are somewhere on that spectrum. And so if we consider that spectrum, <laughs> to help us give a little bit more of a, a different perspective. We can imagine that when human beings evolve, uh, you know, becoming uh, liberated humans from the life and death cycle, that is not the end of their evolution. And if you uh, continue that evolutionary process of spirituality, becoming more understanding, more advanced, more empathetic, um, less connected to ego, uh, less attempting to control, more... Uh, being in service, as as seems to be the case with all of the spiritual practices that I uh, have heard of, um, then it would make sense to continue that uh, to be sort of higher levels of being that are actually um, ethereal and indeed watching over entire planets of species that are much lower level than them and that could really use uh, that guidance. And so this is sort of the uh, point. Uh, oh, okay, hang on. I'm just going to finish this, which is uh, when Drunvalo mentions a galactic command, uh, this is sort of the image that I would like to conjure, which is a group, you know, that came together of uh, highly evolved spiritually uh, beings who have come to the realization that... Um, experiencing life is sort of the be all and end all there is no right or wrong good or bad that's only this idea of uh evolving further spiritually and developing more understanding and bringing along uh, more and more species uh, for that ride um, which i think is a sentiment that we can sort of agree upon at least uh, some some of us <laughs> some of the people here um and understanding that this this idea although it sounds very very uh, alien, um, as uh, as it might be, uh, could actually make a lot more sense than we imagine um, if we leave the human perspective for a very short period. Whew, okay, that was a long one, and I, I chat was going through so quickly that I, uh, oh my gosh, and look at the time, wow. Okay, um, but let me just read this very quickly. Everything is temporary. 
the only difference is time scale. Yes, eventually entropy will prevail and we go back to the darkness from whence we came. There is an end. Well, you say there is an end, um, but what happens after uh, entropy? That's, that's an interesting question because uh, we're looking at an equation, sort of, we're looking at... Okay, so I'm just... <laughs> I've started this conversation. Let me just read. Uh, there isn't. This is what uh, uh, dyslexic Kyle wrote. There is an end eventually. Uh, everything returns to nothing after all. Uh, energy returns back to its natural state of fulfilling its dash towards equilibrium. I look forward to energy death of this universe to see if that is what sparks another. Ah, oh, excellent. Yes. So you ended exactly on what I was going to say. Um, yeah, whenever we feel that we see an end or a beginning or we see sort of, uh, yeah, either spectrum. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 I, I, I've just been, I've fallen into that trap so many times uh, that it's just, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it seems to bite me every time I forget about it. So I really try and remember that whenever I see entropy, um, there's always generation. And whenever I see, you know, positivity, uh, as, uh, as Dr. Becker said, that rubber band is going to snap back. Um, oh, I'm so sorry to hear, Evelina. I hope you uh, feel better and you're doing okay. Um, oh, well, I'm glad you're enjoying it so far. This <laughs> I feel that I sort of raced through that uh, second half, but I hope it was more or less uh, understanding, uh, understandable Sorry for you. Uh, yes, okay, so let me know if there's anything that I should uh, go back and re-touch uh, upon. Okay, 51 minutes. There's one more thing that I would like to sort of go over very quickly, and that's actually good, because this will be the end, and next week we can go back to our narrative um, with a new vigor, I hope. So really, I just wanted to mention this idea of uh, that we talked about of... Um, uh, channeling and uh, mediumship in general, clairvoyance and what all this you know could possibly mean. Because I, I don't know about you guys, but when I, I'm trying to remember the first book that I read about channeling, uh, channel, sorry, challenging, channeling aliens. It's hard to say channeling aliens, um, but it was so out there and so uh, beyond. It was very hard for me to wrestle with in the beginning. And it was sort of a lot of terms that were very uh, bizarre. And more than anything else, it was this description of, you know, uh, this person came into the room, they lay down and they closed their eyes and they went very still um, and their breathing uh, deepened. And then they started talking in a slightly different voice. And this is the thing that they said. Or, you know, they sat down and they took a pen in their hand and their hand started writing, uh, and this is what it wrote. It all seemed so uh, simple and easy. You know, it, it, what if what if it really was that easy to, to be able to talk to aliens? I mean, if you imagine for a minute that, you know, throughout history, um, all you have to do is sit down and, you know, sort of allow it to happen and aliens will contact you that's just unthinkable it's it's you know in my mind that i think the simplicity of it really frightened me and not frightened me just made me uh, suspicious and really i thought that that uh, this couldn't be so easy uh, so simple but um i don't know i just like as I read through more and more of these, um, it seemed to be harder and harder for me to dismiss as simply scams. And although, as I said, I think some of them are, the, the messages and what was inside of them really surprised me because I'm more used to uh, gurus and, you know, and scientists and all these other people who are always asking for money. Uh, it seems to be a real common theme that almost everyone who is considers themselves uh, special in any way is somehow angling to get uh, something out of me. And I don't mean that in a bad way, and I'm the same, and I'm trying to uh, make money off of this podcast. So for a moment, I don't remove myself from that uh, uh, group of people. However, when it came to these alien messages all the way from, you know, the last century, um, they weren't asking money and indeed almost all of the groups who were doing this were volunteers 
And they weren't recruiting people. They didn't have a, 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 a mission to come and join or, you know, they weren't, they didn't seem to have a clear agenda. The only agenda they were talking about was love and peace and harmony on earth and everybody getting along and evolving human beings together to the next level. And I was like, you know, that's weird. That's very, very weird. I've listened to a lot of people who claim to know uh, the truth, etc. But um, I've, I've, it's very, very uncommon for them to be this sort of uh, open about it and not ask for something in return. And that's just something that sort of caught my eye when it came to these uh, things. So first of all, if anyone is sort of channeling, um, well, I guess it depends. I actually went, <laughs> I went to a medium. Uh, I've mentioned this before, I'm pretty sure, a few times even. Um, and I paid, and I would say that I paid a lot of money. I know it's not considered a lot, but uh, in my mind, if all you're doing is, but it was a very powerful experience. And I personally believe that a lot of it was uh, true, etc. Um, so yeah, I, I'm not saying, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying anything really. I'm just blabbering on and I hope some of it uh, makes you feel a bit better. That's really all my uh, intention is. Uh, oh, I see a mention. Uh, Olev, in the next show, would love to hear any thoughts on the Kardashev scale. Oh, I've, uh, oh my gosh, I've never heard of the Kardashev uh, scale. So I don't think you would like to hear my thoughts, but I would like to hear uh, more about it. If you'd like to share in chat and I will read uh, what it is, then I would love uh, to read about it. Um, but I will look into it definitely. And uh, if I, uh, if I have anything to say, <laughs> I'll, I'll mention it. But I'm, yeah, I don't, uh, I've never heard of it. Uh, yeah, Rond Rondon's got me covered. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes, angels and demons. I actually, uh, it's, I wanted to, uh, to mention uh, angels and demons. Um, we didn't actually get into it. Okay. Ah, is a method of measuring technological advancement based on Oh, yeah, type 1 civilization, type 2. Okay, I thank you, because I've never known the word for that. Kardashian scale. I heard it from... Um, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, the, the, the American Japanese physicist who's really into it and everything. Um, oh, I can't remember. Mm, oh, I don't want to butcher his name because <laughs> it won't sound good. Anyway, yes. Oh, you know what? I... And I actually think in one of the episodes I have mentioned uh, that way of of of, uh, of measuring. I think in Sitchins, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, oh, I, I I will uh, I will make sure to uh, to talk about it a little bit next time. I'm always happy for people to actually have uh, requests uh, from the uh, from the crowd. Oh well, Alien Honey and uh, Archangel Gabriel, thank you both so much. Oh. Uh, I, uh, you know what? As far as I'm concerned, I think the whole world should be paid in hugs. I really do. That would be a much, much uh, more stable currency, I think. Michakau, yeah, uh, Michakaku, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes, exactly. Is that how you pronounce it? No, that's not how you pronounce it at all. But uh, anyway, that's who I heard uh, talking about that scale at the first time. Kardashev. Thank you. I will remember that name now much better. Is that the... Uh, I mean, I actually... Yeah, I don't remember where that... Sorry, for those who don't know, I <laughs> have spent all this time I haven't actually mentioned, for those who are just listening and can't see the chat, the Kardashian scale is a scale of, um, yeah, the, well, Carl said it perfectly, a species' ability to harvest the energy around them. And I've heard of it also of sort of how um, uh, harmonious they are with their environment, with their surroundings. And so a level one civilization is in uh, harmony with the planet, so the whole planet as a whole is sort of working together. Um, level two is the solar system, and level three is the entire galaxy. Really? Are those are there subdivisions as well? I thought I remembered being. Oh no no no! You're right, and that's this. Yes yes yes. I think you're right. Um, anyway, yes. For those who were uh, who don't know, uh, yes, I. <laughs> he's a Jew. Um, oh my gosh! Look at the time. I have to go. I was from Israel and now live in Portugal. My name is Olev. It's been an absolute pleasure being here. I'm sorry I have to cut it off. Stay tuned. Is there a post up afterwards? Let's know in chat. But if there is, stay tuned for that. Until then, uh, it's been an abs absolute pleasure being here with you today. Thank you very much for joining me. And I will see you all next week. Until then, have a good one. Bye.